Oh, I don't know. Just something about that music that when I hear it, it just puts a smile on my face. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome in. It is time for another edition. Three guys before the game. I'm so doggone scared. I'll tell you why. Because we're living up to our promises. I mean, we, we'll fall off the cliff soon. Don't I worry. I know. I know. <laughs> we promised you that we were going to do more shows uh, at a quicker pace. And then we snapped one off with Tariq Phillip. And then we came back quickly with Jeff Hostetler. And then, boom. Now, a week later, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, for the first time ever, on Three Guys Before the Game, recording superstar, Mountaineer basketball superstar, podcast sensation, future WVU Hall of Famer, Deshaun Butler with us in studio. Hi. I tell you what, you need a bigger business card, man. I, I, I said, Deshaun, I how should I, how should I introduce you, Deshaun? He said, here, he wrote it down for me. He said, these are the things on my writer that you, some things you must, I had no idea <laughs> that were on my resume. Did so. you ever, have you ever thought of yourself as a future hall of famer? Nah, not at all. You haven't even not, given it thought. Nah, not, not even. You're coming okay. up quick. It's never crossed your mind. Come on. Seriously. Like I've, oh. heard, I've heard the conversation, but I've never like put my two cents in it. So. Well, you're I kind of want to just like let it happen on its own. I mean, yeah. it's a lock. It's a lock. I, the only question is first ballot or not. He's first ballot. Has to be. Hope yeah, you'll so. be first. If ballot. he's not, who is? Yeah, he's first ballot. I hope so. Yeah, I know a guy that's Let's on the pray. committee. Do you? Yeah, me. You put a word in for me. Me. Okay, perfect. <laughs> then I'll, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> so it's yeah, it'll be ten years. So ten was your last. So in twenty twenty, yeah. uh, you'll be up. I was like. Kind of nervous now that you just said that. Yeah, don't worry starting about to, it. Nah, don't. I'm just starting to get a little nah, sweaty. Don't worry about it. It's yeah, so good to have senators here as well. For those of you that aren't watching, for those of you that are watching, thanks so much for being with you. You look good, man. You look like really super summery. I mean, you got like a nice, I mean, it's a good look. I mean, you got the hat. He's styling, right? He's styling. He's no, 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 giving no, no, you a little no, no, Americana no, no. as we head here into the 4th of July yeah, uh, yes, yes, holiday yes. coming up. Yeah. You got you to gotta, you gotta love your country. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're full. <laughs> but, you, I mean, you look good. Thank you very much. A lot of work. I know. I was uh, very heavy. Still working on uh, lowering so I can look even better. Okay, so, so let's go back five steps. <laughs> why, why did you get heavy? Uh, I had a small knee issue uh, this season, toward the very end of the season. So it was small enough where I didn't need to have surgery. But if I continued at the pace I was going, it could have led to that. So I decided to, you know, sit down and not force the issue because, you know, I, I would love to continue to play. Mm -hmm. So Smart. Um, so after that, I sat down for a little bit, just, you know, lifting – and hanging out, there's nothing I really could do except, you know, watch basketball. Mm -hmm. And then I finally got a chance. The season was, was the season was over, excuse me, and uh, just came back home and got a chance to get to to working out. How big did you get? What did the Ooh, scale? What did the scale say? Did numbers the, did, are so, someone. This was someone told me. <laughs> this is what someone so, told numbers me. Someone are so like you know. Well, I don't know if it's true. You tell me if it's true or not. Someone told me. He's that running you, from this exactly. You you, you stepped on the scale. And the the scale automate had a voice inside of it, one of those AI voices, and it really? said, "Come back when you're alone." All right. That's that's, that's that what could the scale, be the story. That's that what could the be scale, the story. That could be said. that could be the story. It could two be a true story. Two sixty, a little bit under that. Two fifty seven. Not 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 that. I'm a little bit further down. I was in the the, the fives and fives. Fours. Yeah. Okay, so you're that's two, the highest I got. That'd be two fifty. Yeah, you were, fitty, and what fitty. should you be? So frame of reference, what would you like to be ideally? 235. <laughs> okay, so you had a good 15-ish. But that's yeah, not. I, I, which is not, you know, it's bad, but it, it could be worse. But so. now you're still young enough. So see, when you're old like Karidi and I, 15, I mean, you, you may be five years before you can get that off. You can right. still you can still churn. Oh, it still hurts right? to try. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's not as comfortable <laughs> as it once was, uh, especially now I'm 30, and uh, I have a knee that's probably at this point in its 50s. Point. So... <laughs> You know, it hurts a little bit more than usual, but I do a now. I would say I've been doing a really good job of taking care of myself, and I'm getting diet or workout both. or both. It has to be both. You can't do one or the other. So, like I had a, I didn't do a good job of dieting initially, but I would say like when we got to the last month of the season is when I, like when I knew where I, I'm getting ready to go home soon. I started, started dieting kick and kicking it in, and from then on. So I would say what. Like the end of like to the middle of April, excuse me, April. Yeah. All right, but here's a challenge because you left something off his resume there. The really the most important thing, uh -oh. Dad. 
Oh, oh yes. Yeah, so absolutely. dad of young Draylon, right? You got a young one. Yeah, I got so two. What, I, what I have found, you, okay, yeah. what I have found is what's really hard about the food portion of getting yourself back in line is all the leftovers they leave around. And you're grabbing here. You, not, you, you didn't eat all your chicken fair. nuggets here. Give me exactly. a couple. You didn't eat all I, those fries. Give them to me. Do you have that same issue? I catch myself from time to time uh, having one of my youngest. He leaves food all over the place, and I'm and you clean it up after him. You're Sometimes, eating but then my dog beats me to it too. Like it's just like it's a competition when it comes down to it. At the end of the day, it's tough, but. I think <laughs> I'm managing to stay away from him. The The youngest is really terrible with his food. Yeah, the kids do that stuff all the time. That's very difficult. Brad and I love <laughs> to eat with a capital L. I mean, love yeah. to eat. And I, here's my belief. I think you do too. It's a and, passion of mine. Continue. Okay. So <laughs> let's just, let's just kind of let that go one more step then. If you didn't, if you weren't an athlete, a professional athlete. That's a big F for when okay. it comes to weight. Yeah. So where would you be? Oh, wow. I don't know. I can't say – it's tough because like, I can't say where exactly I would be. I feel like if I didn't play basketball in college and I just played in high school, I just feel like I would try to stay in shape. I feel like I would surround a lot of my time to do the like workout because I didn't have basketball. Then. I'd, I'd need something to do to work out to keep myself in shape. Were you round when you were young? Not really. I I started out, but uh, I slimmed out as I got older. Like, what, what, when so when older, were you around? Like when were you around? Maybe like, mm, I started to catch a, a little weight around the second grade, but then I got rid of it really quickly. But I would say like it just got got away from me. I in got taller. Grade, it second. helped. A lot of things help. There's a lot yeah. of variations in that. Yeah. Variables. I mean, excuse me. Yeah. Well, okay, well, that's good. I'm, I'm so the knee's good now. Yeah, definitely. Everything's. I've been working out. I've played. You going up and down? You're yeah, playing now. I haven't actually. I haven't played open gym yet. Okay. I've, uh, the only thing I've done so far is just uh, what I think John. Uh, we did. We had the uh, the alumni game. I did that, and everything else has been like individual work. I tend mm -hmm. to do a lot of individual work anyway in cardio, because I and I obviously I play, but if I if I do play, it'll be a lot a lot of one on one. I kind of know what I'm going to do in the five on five setting, but it does help to play a lot of five on five in the summer as well, though. So I will be playing a lot this next month because I've had so much time off. I got to get in uh, rhythm and so on and so forth. Get ready to go. Yeah, the it's plan is you'll, you'll be good. Do you have a contract for next season or? Uh, no, I haven't signed a uh, contract yet. I've ha I've gotten offers though. I've gotten a good bit of offers, but none that I want, and. Also, I'm still debating. I'm doing a lot of family debating on whether the kids and the uh, wife are coming with me overseas or not. So mm -hmm. still debating that because I, I'm a fan of having the kids go to school and be in America. And also I'm a fan of having them with me. So it's just, you know. That's a hard war. deal, exactly. isn't it, man? Tug of war in the head a little bit. but It is, yeah, isn't Tom, it? Got all of July and some August. Yeah. That, that's because now they're getting to the point where they know what's up. Yeah, yeah. right. As they, they know get what's older, coming. yeah, they they get a they get a good grasp. The kids, you can't really hide much from them. So, and once you go, you go, right? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to come back. Yeah, especially with school, you got to sign up. Yeah, because you advance. You got you got. So your oldest is five. He's yeah. He's getting ready to do, do kindergarten this year. Like we're doing a ton of tutoring and stuff like that to make sure he's fine. He's doing perfect actually. He's ahead of the curve, but still. So he's not a redshirt kindergartner. He's a straight nah, he's five a legit. He's, he's a, a legit. legit. He'll be in kindergarten starting this year. I could, his birthday's in June, so I could if I wanted to, but I'm not going to. You didn't. We weren't going to do that. Maybe it it depends. Like he's real. He enjoys like hanging out with the kids he hangs out with with the sports he plays you know you could pull that you could like pull that. that classic parent thing you know oh, the, yeah, you know the, the classic not, hey, i don't want to but the classic parent you know what they the, the real the, the ones that are totally nuts you know what they do <laughs> talk to me they would they go like well, we're gonna do seventh grade twice that's what they do they yes. redshirt them like then they yeah. don't even do it in kindergarten they pull them back it's a like sneaky in, one. It's oh, a sneaky one oh, oh real it's a sneaky because sneaky. Sneaky. everything is it's not official until they get to high school anyway so no one's really paying attention to it much you can slide them Unless they're like really, really good, and you just can't hide the fact that they did what they did. Well, that's how you. Yeah, that's what always like what stands. If LeBron's out kid did it right now, everybody would know because exactly. like they know who LeBron is, and the kid's pretty good too. So like, or if your kid is like six one, six, and, he, one yeah, exactly. and he's in sixth grade, like, wait a second, like, wait how's a that? How did he do six again? But like, this is an easy hide though: the start kindergarten or don't start kindergarten. I yeah. mean, there's only like four people that know that. Yeah. Like, would would you would you consider that a uh, like one grade? I feel like it's like all right. 
Two. <laughs> what do you think? Like, I feel like, because I feel like certain kids, depending on the kid and yeah. depending on what the parent feels, if it's not sports related, or even if it is sports related, if it's one year, it doesn't matter because sooner or later, everybody's going to get in the same playing field at one point and he, the, the kid has to perform or the teenager or right. the adult, whatever the case may be. So no one's always going to be the same age as you. Yeah, I agree. But like, do you think like, one is fine. One's and, fine. And pushing the kid forward, unless the kid is like really, really, really smart, even then I kind of feel like pushing a kid forward is tough too. No, socially they struggle. Yeah, they yeah, they socially. struggle socially. It yeah, doesn't I think one work year, out. I think one year, depending on their birthday for yeah. kindergarten, if the kid's mature, let him go. If he's not mature, hold him back. Yeah. Other than that, leave it, <laughs> it at that. Because it I, 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 in AAU, you see it all. Oh. Like it's, it's like, you see everything as far as kids. Just I'm just going to do this year again. <laughs> Ah, I didn't work out the way I thought it was going to work out like the coach told me it would, so we're going back again. You did six years in high school and a prep school, and then yeah. you end up he goes to a, a, a low or mid-D1 and then just doesn't even play there either. So then it's like now See? You've, taken, you've taken this advice where you could have went somewhere and played and just be happy with what you are and then even find your way to where everybody else is going through a different – you know, people, you, you can get to, you can reach this, uh, success through many avenues. So it's not the, you don't have to go. So he's got to figure it out, Tony. Right? Right? He's got to figure it out. That's yeah. what, that's yeah. how you do it. You're absolutely it's tough, totally man. Yeah. It's tough. I feel bad for the kids, like, because it's, uh, and that's, you know, it's my thing. Like, kids, uh, I feel bad for them when you have the wrong people, like, got guiding you. them. Yeah. You know? Along that line. Along, along that line, exactly. Especially at these ages. Like, when it's, when it's kids, like, I look at people, I look at, the kids being what, twenty and under, like you can get bad advice and really just like screw them up, screw you up for a long time. Speaking so. of that, uh, I wanted to bring that up. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, you've got a foundation, and John Flowers, when he was in recently, uh, talked about that. The portion of the proceeds from his event this year, uh, we're going to go to that. So tell yeah, us about very humbled about that. By the way, that's thank you, nice. John. Tell us about the foundation. Well, like you've, I've lived here for forever. And you know me, uh, when I got, when I was told to, you know, do any type of community service, anything involving kids, regardless, of, whatever, like I'm there. Like I was, I love doing community service cause I, in my head, I know how important it is to, to, to make an impression on someone when they're young. And when I had the opportunity, I felt like to actually start my own nonprofit and help children who might not be as fortunate as the kid maybe standing next to them, I felt like it would be like something I would want to do because I remember when I was in that particular, you know, scenario when I was young, you know, I was, I, and, I, and even then in that place in New Jersey and Newark, I was compared to my friends of having my mom and my dad around in a house and my family had a big family. Like we lived in a rough area, but at the same time, I was I had a lot more than a lot of my friends had, and my dad did a lot of reaching back and helping kids. So that that was kind of like a thing for me, like being a positive male role model in a sense to young kids. Mm -hmm. And with this, you know, not just you know giving kids gifts or you know it, just gifts, basically, just being a positive role model, being around to help when we have events. The events we have are there to help kids get school supplies the events we have are for kids that have friends and they can't go outside and play with their friends because they don't have shoes or running shoes basketball shoes they can't go play uh pe in school high school elementary school can't afford your prom or your prom dress or prom tux like these are things that people look at and including school supplies and just cut them and act like it's no big deal and the kids are the ones that suffer. And then when they get older, they got to raise kids a certain way. And if they're not, you know, helped or, pe or felt as if they're important or felt as if people don't care, I mean, that just is sets a trend for yeah, a great future, point. you know. So is it operating pretty much in Morgantown? Or all through, all through, I say, the county. Like, we, we've raised money, obviously, uh, starting with North for school supplies. Um, and we have other just small events where we raise money for small pockets of pla in certain places. Like we did things with the uh, foster the foster care, uh, West Virginia. Um, we've done things all over for to tell you the truth. Like it's just, I'm all for kids, bro. Like it's what it comes down to is all for helping kids. 
And I want my son to be in an area, especially if I'm living here, I want my son to be in an area where he could be safe. He can feel like he'll grow and he's in, in an environment where he can trust people and trust what's around him and know that his dad's doing the best that he can to make sure his environment is safe too. Great points. Great stuff. Yeah. Great stuff. All right. So we've kind of started current and work our way back. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to your time here. Yeah. Came in with John Beeline. Yeah, the man. Good Ended guy. up with Bob Huggins. Take us back to the transition point first. So you're getting it going under Beeline. You're feeling good. That's the coach yeah. that recruited you, brought you in. Here comes Huggins. What did you heard? What did you know? What was the discussion? What was the thought with you? Bob Huggins is arriving at West Virginia. Ah, uh, well, uh, I don't know. I was really big. I was a really big, big, big Beeline supporter, obviously. Tony, because <laughs> I was a very spoiled uh, kid. I wasn't spoiled going in, and then when I got here and things worked out, Coach Beeline really like took care of me. So, um, and you saw a system that matched. And I saw it something. Was good. Yeah, it was this perfect. Is, we got man. it. Yeah. And I'm not gonna lie. Like in col, like excuse me, in high school, like my coach was really like a really big taskmaster, and then to go to somewhere where I really was never yelled at. And I didn't really, I shot the ball a lot in high school, but I did a lot of like driving to the basket, just like a lot of tough stuff. And all the shots I, I, I ended up getting were not tough at all. It was just, it was like, <laughs> I felt like I got a shot, I, I shot layups and I shot threes and there was nothing wrong and everything I did was perfect. And I never had any problems. So I was a big supporter <laughs> at the time of it. Like I was super, and that's not all John Beeline is. Like there's other things that we did and he's made me, even to this day, the things I've learned from him have made me a better basketball player, and I still use those things. But give me an I example. Play. To go back two Just, steps, there. Oh, Let's ahead, go, go back two steps. Yeah. So you were a huge supporter, you said, because you had a taskmaster high school coach. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. At, at Bloomfield Tech. Yeah. And so you come in here, and basically John says, no F-bombs. You guys don't swear at each other. We're not going to swear at you. It's going to be totally chill. And so it sounds as though you went like, oh, this is awesome. No, it was. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, the fact that everybody – I wonder how everybody bought in. And it was like really confusing at first because I'm sitting here thinking like, <laughs> like, all right, you have these guys from everywhere. This guy doesn't yell. And if where I'm from, if you're not, you're not yelling and demanding attention or respect at a certain point, the kids are just going to be like, man, get out of here. Like, They're going to run over you. Some people are and some people won't. Like, and then you'll just have a half and half team. I watch these guys play on TV. Everything, like someone made a shot. All four other, like all forty other guys are celebrating. The bench is going crazy. I'm sitting. I'm like, this is amazing. What is he doing to help them buy in? And I get here, I never really got yelled at. I got yelled at once, and that was because I was spoiled. And other than that, like during as far as basketball, I never had a problem one time. And he never yelled. He never yelled at anybody really. Like he just never. You saw one guy maybe get dug out once, and he it was no curse words involved in it. And it would be, it would be it more, like, it would be more like this, it's Bobby, like, Bobby, yeah. I'm just so disappointed in yeah, you right now. Yeah, just like now. a stern talking to, and it was just like <laughs> something I've never been a part of. Cause like for somebody to be, I, I kind of looked at it as, oh, he's being nice with me. Why break, break the bond if he's being nice to me? Yeah. You know, and that was my thought process in it. So, but everybody was happy. Okay. Every, in so, a sense. So you were, you go like, how is that guy getting everyone to go like, yay, yay, yay. Everyone's clapping and patting. So how did he do it? How did how did he bring all these divergent personalities and make you guys one? I would say just it was a lot of the things he talked about to us off of the court before we went to practice. The way we practiced, it was just an unselfish way. So, for example, just I remember we had a we had we're having practice and we're working on our, our offense, and I think maybe one of the freshmen might have shot the ball and Frank Young was open in the corner. So if Coach Huggins probably would have a different way of explaining this to people, <laughs> especially if one of the, uh, excuse me, especially if one of the, uh, you know, the seniors and, and, and leading scorers on our team is wide open and a freshman just shot the ball, like not even think, and, and it's a contested shot, but he would stop practice continually. Like I'm talking about, it was like one of those things that really annoyed him. And, 
he would stop practice and explain how important it was to make that extra pass and why he had to make that extra pass to you. And it didn't matter who it was. But at the same time, he set the plays up so he made sure, you know, Frank got the ball. He did it. He, he controlled everything, but in a sense, he made it seem as if, you know, listen, he's going to give you the ball because Frank did do those things and everybody did do those things. When it, because no, everybody's thinking the players are like, all right, this, we're all sharing this like oasis of threes and, yeah. and backdoor layups yeah. and good shots. And he's setting the plays up to get to the, get the guy he needs to got to get the ball. You know, Frank needs to get the ball. Darius needs to have the ball. You know, so it worked out perfectly because everybody got in a sense what they wanted. Freshmen played, some freshmen played, and they were happy with the minutes they got. They wanted more, obviously, but they were happy with the minutes they got. There was never really a I never heard anybody like get dark and get too gloomy about like, oh man, like he plays him more than like I never heard it because that was his rule. Exactly. The one thing you don't complain about is minutes. Exactly. And Drew Shafino learned that. Yeah, and I never heard anybody do it. I hung out with a majority of the team. It was eight freshmen, so I never heard anybody say anything bad about anyone else's minutes or anybody else shooting the ball more than anything. You might get a joke here too about Frank's conditioning and uh, and cramps and stuff like that, but you never really, you never really got dark. So then it was just like a happy, it was a happy environment. And when things are good and you're making shots, it's good. And it's just as bad when you're not, but it wasn't like, you know, bad to the point where he's in there like, Oh, you guys are not doing this. F that. Like, it never got to that. It was just like, we just need to shoot some more shots. Because what he would say is this, right? You guys would go out there where you were too young to play at that yeah. level. As you said, there was way too many freshmen to compete at that level yeah, yeah, when definitely. you were young. So you go out there and sometimes you could beat 20, 25. And the first thing he'd say, look at the box score, and he'd say, I tell you what, we just got some great tape tonight. We're really going to be learning from this. Everything. This is really going to help us a lot. And you guys are going, right? Yeah. And the thing is, it would. I kind of felt like unless – we flat out quit or something like that. He just wasn't happy with our effort. We really never got punished. And it like, for example, I got punished once for, I was late to the bus with Joe Alexander. So me and Joe ran 17s. That was the extent of my punishment for the rest of the year. Like I never had any other problems as far as like, like I don't remember him punishing the team unless like we didn't do a drill correctly and we just kept doing it maybe. Like, we do perfection. If we kept messing up, we just start over. So that would be, like, annoying. That would be our punishment. We never really had a, all right, on the line, or we're going to just practice you guys till you pass out type yeah. deal because that wasn't his style. Like, it just didn't suit him. So you go and you have this season, and you have a good freshman year, and you, yeah. you, you've you perfectly found your role. You yeah. were totally – comfortable with being the guy that's dealing the ball and if you have to shoot it you shoot it but yeah. you weren't out there yeah. you weren't honey no and then you win the nit and then boom <laughs> gone you were pissed oh yeah definitely everybody was you that guys was, were mad no are you kidding me there are tears you should have uh, should have heard some of the uh the conversations between what whether it was from joe and coach beeline or whether it was from darris and coach beeline like you in a sense, he brought eight freshmen in. <laughs> so he's literally like, uh, and he's never really believed in, from what I understood, he never br like brought any ju Juco guys in really either. That was like a no-no for him. So like for you to have not eight scholarships, I think we had like seven scholarships and one, one walk-on. So he brings eight freshmen in. Like the, it's just like the team is starting from the ground up regardless. So you're thinking he's going to be here a while, and then, boom. So guys were very distraught, to say the least. And it, and it it was not only fast, but it was it was right in that moment. I mean, it was the extreme high of that was a heck of a run through the NIT. You went, and then, boom, mm. it's not even out of the locker room yeah. from celebrating. And that great moment yeah. that you could normally hang your hat on turns, turns into yeah. what that yeah. heck just Literally, happened to us here. It just made us think less of the NIT in a sense. We didn't really Yeah, because it held a bad about, memory now, yeah, not a great exactly. memory. Exactly. It wasn't even anything. Yeah. You couldn't it enjoy it. Couldn't enjoy it. They messed up the shirts. They, they freaking <laughs> they did mess coach up left. The like, it was just like. They did mess they, up they the shirts. A, it was a lot. You know, it was a lot. You know. Was, yeah, that's so true. I, I've always felt the same thing. That I felt that like was, it was just like a terrible moment, per se. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. And, the, and the, at that point where you're going to celebrate a championship, they give you T-shirts that spells West Virginia wrong, and the coach, and the coach leaves. And so now let's walk to the next step. 
So you're in this little Disney world of, hey, everything's good and everything's fine, and here comes the bear. What did you know about them? What, had your, what was your perception of hugs, and how did that unbelievable 180 happen? Well, I don't, you don't really know much, and this is for any parent that has, like, kids that are in high school and or in college. If you're going to, getting ready to go to college, your kid's getting ready to go to college, he's doing these visits, the kids don't know what they're getting ready to do. Like, you, you leaving a choice up to a kid to go to school, and, and you got to pick your school as an athlete. But, like, I went here thinking one thing, and it was the, the total opposite. <laughs> and – even then, when you get into situations like that, when a coach leaves, you uh, you don't know what's going to happen. You could get a coach. And I've never, like, you know, I, I've always been the kind of person that, like, I would watch basketball at the level I was at. I never really was big in watching college basketball. So, like, when I was in high school, even, like, until I was getting ready to go to college, I'm like, let me pay attention to this stuff. I don't want to <laughs> be bombarded. I don't know who's who. You know, all that stuff. But I was watched to my level and – I didn't know what happened when coaches left in college. So, and none of us did. <laughs> so we didn't know whether like this guy was going to come, Coach Huggins was going to come here and kick us all out. Like all I knew was that the guy was a really good coach, really big yeller, really big on defense and rebounding. And he had been fired and got his job. Like, and, I, and I heard that all he coached a lot of goons. That was what the, the – that was the – so that, that's your mindset as that he's was getting ready to come in. So I'm getting, he's getting ready to come in, and I'm. Are you thinking I'm out? This isn't going to fit? This is going to be bad I, for me? I was thinking I'm out because he doesn't know who I am. Like, uh, he hasn't seen me play, and yeah. he probably has guys that he wants to bring in. This is, like, right before Michael Beasley even signed or was going there. Yeah. Like, he had the option to get out because the coach left. Yeah. So everybody's like, oh, well, he might bring this guy. He might do this. He might do that. And I don't know. Like, I don't have no idea what's going on. So in my head, I'm kind of like – I might want to look around and keep my options open just in case because I don't want to get booted out. But then at the same time, another thing is, like, I've played basketball with goons before. <laughs> like, I'm from I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I've played <laughs> in some of the worst areas ever and have been fine and, and held my own and never had to worry about, like, my manhood being questioned. So I was like, there's no need for me to run either. And not to mention, I felt like I was more prepared than my counterparts, except for me, like me and Joe. I felt like me and Joe were very, and Wellington, Wellington plays in, played in New Jersey. I felt like us three were well, like, would be well equipped and be more than fine. I wasn't sure about everybody else. I didn't know, like, if everybody else was worried about leaving or not. Like, in my head, I was saying, well, I did well as a freshman here and, like, counting, like, you know, looking at everybody else. I think I did well as a freshman and I did better than some of, the upperclassmen too. So I feel like I'm in a sense solidified at least to like, to get looked at. So I, 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 look, I kept my options open, but in my head, I was, I'm staying here. Like, I don't see why I would leave. I thought about leaving, but I was like, it's not smart. So that sound, I did well here. Doesn't that sound like the classic fear of the unknown? Like it, just in, in the retelling it, you can tell you were probably on different days. You were all over the place. No, yeah, I'm definitely. out. I'm no, okay. Yeah. Then you kind of bucked up and said, all right, bring it on. You want to yeah. yuck it up and play an ugly style? I got that. I can. So it sounds like you were coming in and out every day. Yeah, it was what, like, what I, I'm not going to lie. It was a good like four days where I was just kind of sitting there like, yeah, what am I going to do? And in that fourth day, I kind of felt like, you know what? Like, All right, let's go. I'm good. I'm not worried about it. Like, I'm going to get menaced because of the numbers we have here. If he's going to get rid of people, he's going to get rid of people. But I'm, I'm I in. want them to at least see me. So then I know, like, if I had to leave, I was kicked off. If I had to tramp, you made a mistake. I want you to see me play. <laughs> that's that's interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. I want you to see me because then sooner or later you're going to see me again. Like, at that point, I did well enough in the conference that I felt like I could have went to a biggie school. Sure. Yeah. Like, it, I I made a team. I was like, all right, cool. Well, if I have to go somewhere, I'll go somewhere and probably play. Perception is reality is kind of how we say it. Yeah. So the, the perception was, okay, here comes this guy. He yells, he screams. He's had guys that you said is, you know, that he's coached goons. Do you specifically remember the first team meeting? I, have, I remember my first meeting with him, period. Okay, and yeah. and what was that like? Um... So I'm called into the office, which it won't be the first, like it won't be the last time, obviously. But I'm called into the office, and he, uh, I sit down, 
And this is the office in the Coliseum at the time. So I sit down in a chair and he goes, yeah, what's going on? I'm like, how you doing? And he goes like, I watched a, I watched a good bit of film on you. And I'm like, oh, really? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, I talked to John Beeline. And I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. And he told me to make sure I, I took really good care of you. So then when I heard that, I was like, all right, I'm staying. So I'm like, all right, that cool. Fast. That so fast. First, I was like, first line out of Huggins' mouth yeah. and you're locked. You're I'm like, happy. I'm, I'm good. like, all right, cool. So he wants me to stay. So I was like, that's a good thing because I've been here. So I'm happy to be here. And uh, so he's talking to me about what he may do and may not do. He's talking about John and Will Thomas. And he's like, I'm bringing in, I'm bringing in a guy, but I have a guy that's already we've offered a, a scholarship, and you know that's another reason why I wasn't really worried either for John, because John plays played basketball in the city. So we're talking, like, for those who don't know, we're John talking about Flowers. John Flowers. He had committed to Beeline, but Beeline had left. Coach yeah. Beeline had left by the time uh, it was time for John to come. So you know we spent a lot of time talking to John, trying to get, convince him to stay, and he decided to stay. So that was another reason why I wanted to stay as well, because we had made like really good friends with John. Uh, and then he looks at me and he goes, "All right, well I've got to talk to John. I'm going to go to DC right now, but I just wanted to make sure I checked in with you before I got out here. I just spoke to Joe. Uh, he spoke to Joe Mazzulli, spoke to Joe Alexander, Alex, Darius, and he spoke to me. And he was like, "Let me ask you a question." And I'm like, all right, cool. What's up? He goes, you want to play in the NBA? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, stay here. You'll play in the NBA. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm sold. I was like, all right, fine. I've heard about the guys that he's got in there. I met, I met a couple of the guys before too. Like everybody had nothing but positive things to say about him that played for him. All the things I heard were from people that never played for him. So I was excited to see what it was like. And it was tough. <laughs> it was very difficult the first year. Hold on. Before before you go there, because I do want to get into yeah. then what practice was like, that's interesting on that NBA comment. At that point, had you already started thinking, hey, the NBA may be something. I, I got a shot here. Or was that still so I'm distant? Not, but oh, he yeah. put that in your head. Now you said, well, if this guy's got confidence, I got a shot here. Did that help move you along confidence-wise when he said that? It wasn't the fact that, how can I put it? I guess maybe that's the, in a sense it could be that. I, I always thought I was going to go. <laughs> you did? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I personally always, that was just my mindset. Anybody I played against, like, I couldn't wait to, when I got to college, to play against all those guys from high school. Like, I couldn't wait to play against them so I could see them. Like, that was, like, my, like, I didn't, I wasn't really worried about the competition of my teammates because, like, we're playing together, and if I did well, I thought I was going to do well. Like, I was going to be, I wasn't worried about that. All I really cared about was, going and playing against the guys who were supposed to go to the NBA, like either right out of high school, but they changed the rule my my yeah. uh, my the year before I got to be a senior in high school. And the guys are supposed to be one and done. So there was a ton of them in our conference. So who were some of those names where you were going like, come on, I heard about you, bring it, let's go. Well, I couldn't wait to play huh, everybody at Duke. I couldn't wait to play Chase Budding or, and I couldn't wait to play Earl Clark. These are guys I played against before as well. So like I knew – what I could and couldn't do. And I knew what they could do. I'm not, you know, discounting them. I just knew how much I wanted to compete against them and what I felt that I could do. So to answer your question, I always felt I was going to go. Okay. It was already in your head. It was already you didn't in my need head. that extra I push. Got, in high yeah. school, when I, felt, when, I, when I got a chance to play against a lot of good competition and I saw myself doing well and I realized it's, it just depends on what day it is and what you're doing and how much work you put in, I was already locked in my yeah. head of what I was going to do. It's just a matter of where I was going to do it at, in my head at least. But uh, when he said it, and I knew that he had NBA players, and he said he watched me play and seen tape and talked to the coach specifically about me and so on and so forth, I was like, all right, cool. It's, it's always good to have another person that believes that they can get you there too as well as I do so we can work together to reach the same goal. Would you agree that it's really interesting of what Hugs's perception is that people have that may not know him, they think loud, and they think uh, a bit crazed because that's what they see. And then when you probably sat down in that chair in his office for the first time, you were probably going and you said, wait a second, this is 180 degrees difference because he talks like real slowly, yeah, yeah, all yeah. chilled out. Quiet, like, so, and so quiet relaxed. and you're going like, wait, wait a second. <laughs> I thought I thought this was the guy that was like all crazy, right? Yeah, man. It was, it, was, uh, it was the calm before the storm. <laughs> it's just, what, yeah. what do you mean by that? Because well, when... When we got picked up and we got started, 
it was very different. Like like I told you, the man loves great defense. He loves rebounding. And he loves big players, physically fit players. And we were none of those three. <laughs> so at that time, it was a very like physically trying time and mentally trying on the basketball court because everybody is doing things that they didn't have to do. And they played in college games. You know, these guys have played in college games for a year. Talking about the freshmen. Sophomores have had that kind of schedule for two years. Some guys have had that schedule for three years. So now, like, that's why I said small again was great. Um, Darius was great. To be able to just, Darius was amazing just to be able to put his best foot forward in that situation and just, and come out on top. I thought Darius was perfect. I thought Joe Alexander was perfect. Just to be able to go into that kind of fire and then lead the group as well through it. And he led us through that. It was tough. And by the time we got Pat out of uh, out of summer, like a lot of guys' bodies looked very different. And it made us want to do it more though. Like it kinda it was like it was very like it was the incentive about it. Like it was just like, oh wow, like we don't look scrawny anymore. <laughs> like There's the a one, new culture. From one summer yeah. to the next, the culture of how we looked was different. We still didn't know how to compete the right way though. But at that time, it's like right in the beginning of the year. So we got there in August. The co- like what we looked like definitely changed in three months. What are your recollections of the first practices when the hugs that was in the office was now the hugs that was on the court and he was in his own way communicating to you just how important defense, rebounding, and toughness is? Was it, did you go like, holy heck? At times, did you have questions in your head where you went like, whoa? You didn't have time for it. It's like one of those things where when you get this new coach or you I mean, I guess this is how I looked at it. I can't say this is how it works for everybody, but when he start, started getting there, when he got there and started throwing the, the drills at us of what we needed to do, so like two and two sprint to help, four and four plus one, one-on-one defensive drills, things of that nature, it was so much of a culture shock to us that he didn't have to yell or anything. Like he, he didn't, We didn't really get him raising his voice until we started season or like a week before the season started, maybe. Like before our first game, like even then before our first exhibition game, I would say, we didn't really get yelled at. And then right then and there, we started picking it up because we were too busy getting killed. He didn't have to really yell. Like we, when we made mistakes, we were on the treadmill and he didn't, he didn't have to, like we were getting punished. So it was no, it was no point in yelling. Like he's, trying to see who's going to, I don't know if he's trying to see who's going to quit, but it's in a sense, like you see who is when the time is right and when it's not. So like, he's just watching us and putting us through all these obstacles and whoever, like, you know, it's practice. Like we're, we're going to work on the things we need to work on our offense. We're going to work on what we need to do defensively most of the time. And I, we spend most of the time working on defense and it was just so bad at one point that it's like, you know, he couldn't really just yell, yell at us that early because like, He'd be yelling at absolutely everybody. Like right. it'd be an all an entire and all day thing. So when the games started yeah. and he and now he, he starts picks up. Now it's new. It's new it, and it's completely different from what you had. Yeah, it's new because we knew he yelled. Like, you know, he had a oh or something like that. But when we got to the games, <laughs> like it was more like uh it turned into um a a a, a masculine thing. Manhood questions. Manhood questions. What challenging your manhood? Challenging of manhood questions, and it wasn't in a in a way where someone would say, "Oh, that's disgusting." It's just more like it gets a rise out of you to an extent where you're like, "Excuse me," <laughs> and it's in front of your peers. So now it's like everybody knows, like he's talking to you. It puts you in like a lot of like trying scenarios, and you find out a lot about yourself, like when when things don't go your way and then someone's talking to you a way that you don't like what you do. What did you learn about yourself? I already had that in high school. <laughs> At that level? It wasn't that big a deal. At that me. level. All I needed to do was figure out how I can get him, the one guy, to keep me on the court. I, and, I, and then I realized it's not just one guy that keeps you on the court. But 
I was at that point, that was my sophomore year. I was figuring out how I can make him like, all right, cool. All right, what's going to keep me on the floor compared to the guys next to me? And what was it? I could score the basketball. <laughs> and I made smart plays from time to time. So, and then at the end of the day, I was doing a little bit better than everybody else that was around me, except for, you know, guys like Darius, guys like Joe Alexander, Alex. At the time, like, I was probably, like, fourth in line. So, like, I kind of knew where I was in line, in a sense, from what I was producing. But, see, that's fascinating because you already had it in you. You were analytical enough to figure it out. Yeah, a guy like line. Alexander, I think, is the perfect example, who at times looked lost in the beeline system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here comes Huggins, and he's lighting a fire. And as we know, that last month under Joe Alexander yeah, was, was unbelievable. unbelievable. You could see Alexander fought back like, all right, come on, I got it. But Give the me thing the is, though, like even, even my freshman year with Joe as a sophomore, you saw these things of what he could do. It was always a matter of, if you felt like that, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like it just like I, it felt like to me. It felt like if he, if you he felt like doing it, like because Joe in my eyes could do anything, right? Like he puts the time in to get bigger, he put the time in the gym to get better. So I personally felt that Joe w was interested in the playing time that he got to go to a bit. Like I'm not sure what colleges Joe Alexander w was going to go to, but if it came down to my thought process, I thought he went to the biggest school he can go to. He did. And that's what I did, too. I was like, I want to play the biggest school I can play at. Yeah. And that'll be where I call home. So I was, I'm not sure Joe went to Beeline for the offense and everything mm -hmm. else. Joe went for the opportunity to go and compete at a high level at, at a school. And that was always his mindset. So when we saw him play against a DePaul and see what he does to who Wilson Chandler has been in the NBA for like 12 years. But just to see how, like how he did in a, a game like that against DePaul and Sam Mejia and Wilson Chandler and all those guys, and then go and watch him play pretty decent against uh, Georgetown. Granted, we lost those game, that game pretty bad, but he did really good against Jeff Green and saw like how he performed and how he can, how he went and attacked the rim when he played South Florida, who had like the, the number one shot blocker in the, uh, in the Big East and almost in the country that year. So, and another one, Duquesne and Sean Jane, like, you know, like he always attacked and he always wanted to compete. So I always saw that in him. It was never like, I, I thought that he was just in love with the beeline system to come to school. It's just the, co the competitive part. So I knew he would thrive when he got a chance to just go So he was the play. rare guy that didn't necessarily fit into beeline system. That was, yeah. beeline rarely missed on he guys didn't, that didn't fit. He didn't fit, like he could fit because of what he can do, like because of the, the, the natural ability that he had. Like he wasn't just a knockdown jump shooter, but if you like left him open, he's gonna mm -hmm. knock down right. jump shots. So you couldn't really leave him open, which means that you gotta, you gotta be up on him. And if he has to be in a system where back cuts work, he's gonna back cut and dunk it. And so it's points. So it, it works. It works when you have like great athletes, obviously, but it just didn't work for Joe because Joe wanted to get the ball and play and make plays as opposed to wait for plays to be made for him. Which then happened under Huggins, Which right? Happened, Where you got some ISOs in late. A sense, in, he got like yeah, he got yeah. he got ISOs as the season went on. Right. And it it works out because like that's just the style of play that he has. And it just so happens that Coach Huggins helped him, you know, you know bring that out. You know, polish his style yeah. up and it looked great. It did. Like it was beautiful. Like, I was that he's the reason. He's the reason for a lot of the things that I did basketball wise. You know, like for my teammates, I respect my teammates a ton, and I respect like one or two things like very dearly about each of my teammates in a sense. And Joe's like somebody I like, truly respect. Like one of my favorite players that I've ever played with. So for what reasons? What did you get from him? Just seeing him work. Always, uh, my I got told you I was like fourth in line in a sense, uh, playing for hugs my sophomore year, and I always wanted more. I was like, you want more as a player, so I want more. Like I want more shots. I want like if I make three shots or two shots in a row, why am I not getting a third or a fourth <laughs> shot? Why are we going to Joe? Mm -hmm. And I never noticed it because I'm doing all these things. I'm playing. I'm scoring. I'm helping out from time to time, and it's not consistent. Not really consistent. It's like. It's somewhat consistent, but it's not as consistent as it should be. 
And I see Joe in the gym every day before practice. And if it's not before practice, it's after practice with Coach Harrison. He's shooting, he's shooting. And I'm like, he's doing all this, and I'm not doing this. And, like, why are they not, like, an idiot? Like, why are they not, like, noticing, like, I don't have to do all that. Like, I, if they work with me, I can do more. To, like, you know, I'm thinking, like, they got to come to me like an idiot. Like, and I'm sitting there, like, some this complete dummy and just not working out every day. And we end up uh, going to the Sweet 16, and I played well, but I didn't have the showing I thought I wanted to have at, for the entire tournament. I thought I played, like, okay. And then I had a really bad summer. So I went to Taiwan that summer. Me and Wellington went to Taiwan. Wellington, like, killed. He averaged, like, I want to say 20 points. And I think I was averaging, like, maybe five or six. And I just played terrible. And I came back. And I just still was, like, lax. And we just got Andy Kettler in there, and I was lax with Andy, and I was getting in trouble a ton. Just, like, a punishment as far as, like, you know, being late to stuff, which is terrible. So with a new strength coach especially. And I just kept getting called on and called on. And then all of a sudden, like, Hugs had to call me in his office. like, listen, like, you don't work out any before practice. You don't work out any after practice. You're not putting any extra work in. You're showing up late to stuff. Like, I, we lost in the sweet 16. You didn't get us there. Someone else probably did. And you're walking around here like you did something. You haven't done anything. If you keep it up, you're not going to be here. So it was like, kind of like a wake up call in a sense where I was like, all right, cool. I had a, I felt like I was more important than I was. And I had to get checked a little bit to realize like, I didn't backpedal on how I felt about myself, but I said if I had to make everyone else feel the way I wanted to feel about myself, I had to put the work in. And then I did. So I want to say from the middle of summer, I got together with, uh, I want to say Triggs, did a ton of ball handling and stuff. And this is the summer that Devin Ebanks is coming in too. So, like, basically spots up. Like, I've I've been in the doghouse basically. Not worse than uh, some other teammates, but, like, I've been in a doghouse, basically. And now we got these new guys coming in. And now it's like, all right, well, job's up in the air now. So now I got to earn my spot again. And I just put a ton of work in every day, like, from the middle of the summer to the so season started, I was working. And when season started and I could work with Coach Harrison, I worked with him every day before practice, after practice, sometimes both, before we got to our first scrimmage. So, like, just seeing Joe do that, and I, he gave me the, he gave me the blueprint. I wish I just saw it first, as mm-hmm. opposed to just like passing it off like it was nothing. And then Joe also was the reason why I decided to play again. So Joe came and he's like, like I know you like coaching and this is fun. He like helping people and so on and so forth because you're just a helpful person. But you love to play basketball, and you're sitting here like just rotting away. And I can tell you want to still play. You know, he came to one of our practices, like, in like, while I'm during, in the middle of practice, during practices, talking to me about this stuff. And I did want to play. I did miss playing. So I got in shape and then had to go try out for my first team overseas. And then I got my job. And I could have just said no. And then sat Unf- down Unfulfilled and, and always wondered what yeah, would have happened. I always wonder what if, if it was the case or not. Like, if I could actually still play after injury and so on and so forth. So, Joe, I like, I respect the hell out of Joe. He's somebody, uh, you know, I always wanted to, basketball-wise, like I always admired his game and his mentality. His mentality is what I admire more. You got killer mentality. Yeah. And killer. That's Absolutely. all it is. Killer. And it's like, I thought, I, I always thought of myself as in a sense like that, but his is just like, it's on, it's on hyper, hyper, like hyper drive. It's like, yeah. he sees red and he goes and yep. he's, that's a hell of a, that's a hell of a gift. What's interesting is that, so Joe was the person that you looked to to put in the extra work. No, 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 not all, not just Joe. Like I, I told you, I respect a ton of my teammates. Oh, Alex I Rudolph is like another one yeah. of those guys too. But then, so. but then you became the poster child that Hugs would refer to after you had left, and still does, and still does. Why don't you get in there and practice like Day did? And so it kind of just carries over. And then Javon, yeah, most yeah. recently, he yeah. became that guy. Well, look at him. That's yeah. how you're going to get on the floor. Yeah. So it kind of. It carries over. Yeah, and I try to give the younger guys a scouting report on it all the time. Like, especially if I see somebody that's like really, really talented, like really good, 
and they're young, even if they're older. Like I talk to Dax all the time when I came back, and I talk to Javon. And Javon, you don't have to have to talk to JC. Like he just did it. Like, but uh, I always try to tell those guys like, if you're smart, because it's all his business. You need to get one of these assistant coaches. They don't. They don't know the game of the assistant coaches. Not all assistant coaches play games, so I'm not trying to say that there's a game being played here. But if you play it the right way, you'll have somebody backing you <laughs> if you're smart. You have an advocate. You have an advocate for you. Mm-hmm. When you're putting in work and these per- these people are with you every night before and after, you have somebody advocating for you to go out there and play and maybe have a if – if the coach sees – like if the head coach sees you actually putting this work in, he might become a believer in what you can do. But if you don't put the work in, how can they trust you? And if they can't trust you, how can they put you in the game? It's all relative. So mm-hmm. if any young individuals in high school or even in college now, any players, play the game the right way. It's all game. Basketball's game, and it's a game within it. So just play it the right way. All right. I know we're getting long on time here, but I've, I've got to ask you this because yeah, I, 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 we have not talked about this, you and I. Your part – of one of the most iconic moments in West Virginia history, although it was one of your worst moments. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Final four, knee, Huggins over you. A couple parts to this. Have you gone back and watched that? Have you gone back and watched any part of that game or that particular moment, or is that just in the past, I'm out, I've moved on? Um, sheesh, I've watched the game before. I've watched that, I want to say the entire game, I watched that, like, that, uh, that, that moment. Yeah, that time, moment yeah. or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I've seen it before. I don't really get the uh, – I get what – celebrating what Coach Huggins, you know, did in a sense, like just, you know, showing, like, some support for me because, you know, like I said, that was probably like, the worst moment that I had had happen to me up, in that, up until that point, like, in my life. So him being able to be there for me as a support, as a support system, like he's always been. You know, I wouldn't, like, besides my dad being there, Coach Huggins would probably be, and my my, my teammates would, buy, like, be the next people I would want near me because we, we've been through so much together. So that, <clears throat> that like, you know, I get the, the aspect of, you know, if you see a picture of it or the moment. Mm-hmm. But anything else past that, I'm not really. <laughs> but see, so that's interesting because that, that wasn't out of character yeah, yeah, for him to be there no, with you because no, you've seen me. that. But nah. I think it's iconic Every for fans day. because fans never saw that yeah, side. Yeah. Exactly. Like, Coach, I mean, everything I've been saying is that side of him. You know, someone, for the most part, I'm not a bad person. So he didn't really have to just hover over me like maybe some other basketball players that he had in the past. He could have easily just let me waste my talent. Because he's like, oh, he's not a bad person. He'll finish school. He'll be fine. He won't go out and do anything dangerous to, like, hurt anybody. Or, like, he's a nice guy. So I'm going to just let him be. He could have just let me be lazy. Right. He cared for me enough to let me know by not letting me be lazy. For not by not. It's, it's all life lessons, man. Like, working well with people, owning your own stuff. You're not winning. You're not going to win every day. How to, you don't have to lose to learn. Things like that, like. You you learn these things, do right. It's important because these are things you want to learn in life. Like you want your kids to learn, and sometimes people don't get a chance to teach their kids these things, and then he gets them. So he ends up teaching these kids from whether they be past mistakes that he's made, and or other mistakes that he's seen other players make. He he's he's been around for forever, you know. So if anyone ever is like you know has ever criticized them or any kind of thing like that. It's from people that know him. It's just like it's noise. Like it doesn't even mean anything. It's because obviously they don't know who he is. Like you can't go. You can't be in this business this long, and people not like you. Right. Like love you for you to stay. You even even through mistakes that, that he may have made or not. Like for him to stay. Like that's you got to think that people. He has to have won a lot of people over. And it's not because he's sneaky or anything. Like, he's a, gen- a genuinely good person. So, Final point here, specific yeah. is Brad's point, to the injury. While that was so devastating physically, mentally for you, uh, for Mountaineer Nation, for the whole deal, now that it's been eight years and you look back at it, can you say that that actually made you a better person? 
you can a certain things like how can I put it? If these things don't happen the way that they do, things would change for me from that point till now. Like maybe I, might I should not rephrase that. Things. Can I rephrase it? Oh, God, I did it make you angry? Definitely did. Does I was it still very make you? Does it still make you angry? Mm, I kind of look at it like more or less like uh, like at this point I kind of look at it as like a blown thing. I think that just had like terrible word to use, but <laughs> like a it's like as an opportunity that it was a really great opportunity that I had to like you know set myself up or play basketball in the NBA, like what I wanted to do, which I never really got a chance to do. It was just, it was just like a moment, like, damn, I, I could have did that. But am I angry about it as much as I was then? Nah. When it happened, then I was in a very, like, very bad place. Mm -hmm. So, like, that point for, like, I would say, like, two years, it was just not cool. Like, I was super, super, super down about it. Mm-hmm. You learn to dig yourself out of those things. You have other things that happen in life that, you know, are more important. So you learn to just keep going. You dabbled in coaching between uh, <laughs> yeah, playing. So do you see when the when you do put the ball away for the last time that you, you might do a little that coaching deal or not? I'm Something not else? sure, Tony. Like, I really don't know. Like, I just like doing so many things. That could that could be a problem. So yeah, <laughs> I don't I know. know. Yeah, because like, you got to be married to exactly. Coaching. You know, <laughs> you got to be married to something, and you got to put a lot of effort into it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to find the thing that is. Like, I think I don't it could know. be I podcasting. Love, it could be. It could be that. It could be coaching. It could be training kids. It could be just you know making sure I'm. I could just work a regular job and just making sure I'm around my kids every day. Like, I don't know, bro. It's just it just depends, mm -hmm. but. It's all, it'll all be from a good place and uh, <laughs> and hopefully helping people at the same time. So it'll work. It'll indeed, work. exactly. It'll work. Okay, give one last shout-out to your podcast. Pete, you need subscribers. <laughs> These guys need subscribers. So tell us. So it's <laughs> you and John Flowers and then whoever else is around? Yes, it's me, my guy John, my guy Rick, my guy Kevin Jones. My guy Rick, we call him Quarter Black. Mainly because he's the only white guy that grew up. It's a reverse joke. Like we 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 have we have some fun with it. But uh, shout out to my guy Rick. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, subscribe to the Final Forecast if you get a chance. Please, it's a good group. It's a lot of fun. We have a good time. We talk about everything that we can think of and uh, make some fun of it. We also talk about things that you may need to talk about sometimes. But at the same time, we all we have some fun with it. So what's it rated? Uh. PGR. <laughs> if I had to say, I had to say PG, something. PGR. So it's probably an R. Yeah. You probably got to go R there back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, mom and dad, make sure Junior's not listening by himself. Definitely huh? not. Definitely for the adults. Hey, man, that's an hour. Uh, we really, truly appreciate uh, your time. Great to catch up. And so um, Thanks for having me. you'll know pretty much when. What month will you think you'll know where your walking papers are going to send you next? Uh, probably toward the end of July. End of July. Yeah, man. Hopefully. Uh, we got some good news. So. I hope so. Yeah. You played really well last year. Yeah, it was not a bad year for me personally. Uh, besides the like the small the small injury, it wasn't a bad year. I thought I had a good year. Good. Yeah. How much how much more do you think you have left in you? Oh, hopefully like a lot. I like to play, man. I just like the competition. It's Another just, five. Mm, hopefully my body can last it. <laughs> my body lasts. That's how long I'll play. When it gets to the point where it hurts and I can't do it, and it's like a task to get yeah. me out of the bed, and then I'm like, nah, I'm done. Got it. Yeah, All right. Man. Fire up the band. Fire up the band. There it is. Oh, yeah. All right, everybody. It's been Deshaun Butler with us on Three Guys Before the Game. From here on in, the Deshaun Butler episode. Don't forget to subscribe. Give us a rating. We'd love to hear from you. We are out for the Senator, for Deshaun. Thanks for being with us. Three Guys Before the Game. See y'all. Yeah.